Can you believe that Thanksgiving is this week? What is going on? Uh, I'm super biased. Thanksgiving is easily my favorite, ho- favorite holiday for a bunch of reasons. Reason one being that there are no gifts. There isn't the giving and receiving of gift pressure that Christmas brings, which means you spend less money. You don't have to pretend like you like that sweater that you got from your mom again, even though she gave you one last year and the year before that. You don't have to buy gifts for your second cousin twice removed who only seems to show up at a time when gifts are being exchanged. You just show up. Maybe you bring some food, but that's it. The second reason I love Thanksgiving is because of football. In my house, this means I don't have to watch Bluey or Peppa Pig, which is great. We have a rule that when football's on, dad gets first choice, and the cherry on top is when Dallas loses. It's like the best. (laughs) Uh, This year, they play the Giants, so hopefully they both lose. It's not possible, but it'd be better than a tie. Uh, Reason three, and the most important one, is because of the food. Right, there's nothing better than turkey and mashed potatoes and gravy, deviled eggs, pumpkin pie, greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, lambs, rams, hogs, dogs, you name it. Right? And it's not just the food you eat on the day. It's also because you get leftovers. What holiday gives leftovers the way that Thanksgiving does? Halloween doesn't do that. Valentine's Day doesn't do that. Have you ever had a leftover hot dog from the 4th of July? That's gross. OK, don't do that. So it's food and rest and no gifts and food. It is the best. Earlier this week, I came across an article that had just random Thanksgiving food facts in it that were all just kind of hard to believe. The article stated that 46 million turkeys are eaten around Thanksgiving, which I imagine the rest of the year, it's like 10, right? Nobody eats turkey outside of at Thanksgiving. It said that Americans consume 80 million pounds of cranberries during Thanksgiving, and this includes 5 million gallons of jellied cranberry. Shoppers purchase nearly 214 million pounds of potatoes and 50 million pounds of sweet potatoes the week leading up to Thanksgiving. And people purchase 19 million ready-made pies ahead of the holiday. But here is the best part. The article said that despite all those extra holiday calories, you probably won't gain much weight from Thanksgiving feasting. And this is probably the most mind-blowing fact of them all. In spite common wisdom and myth that people gain an average of five pounds, which I'm sure you've heard before from Thanksgiving, the truth of holiday weight gain is minor. People do gain weight around the holidays, but it's usually eight-tenths of a pound, according to a 2015 study from the New England Journal of Medicine. This came from doctors, y'all. We can trust it. In fact, it says, despite that, the fact that more than 85% of study subjects made no efforts to control their weight, large weight gains over the holiday season were not the norm, is what the authors of the study wrote. And so with all of this being true, guess what we're going to do today? After church, we have a mashed potato bar, because we can, right? Uh, so you'll go out in the lobby, you'll grab your mashed potatoes, you put your toppings on it and enjoy. Uh, I love mashed potatoes. This is my comfort food. This is probably the best post-service thing we have ever done in the history of Collective. Aren't you glad you came to church today? And listen, if you don't like mashed potatoes, just kidding. Who doesn't? No, one person. There's one person in first service, too. They go to a different church now. <laughs> it's fine. Listen, you can eat the bacon bits or something. I don't know. So, so that's the good news, right? That's the good news for today. You can eat all the mashed potatoes you want over the next week, but, but I do have some bad news. The comfort that warm, velvety mashed potatoes can bring you on Thanksgiving doesn't make your family drama disappear. That brief moment of bliss when you take the perfect bite of potatoes and gravy doesn't make your family dysfunction magically turn into peace and harmony. Maybe for a few minutes because their mouths are full, everyone stop, stops giving their hot takes on crypto and the elections and reality TV. But as soon as dinner is over, your family is back to being your family. And because that is true, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how do we deal with this? How do we manage our dysfunctional families, especially around the holidays? And I think we can all agree that holidays bring a ton of tension. Studies have found that 88% of people find the holiday season stressful, right? You are stressed out right now, and 88% of people agree, I feel stressed out as well. But for people who travel, that number actually jumps to 98%. 98% of people during the holidays, if you travel, uh, consider it stressful. My only guess for those 2% is they actually don't do anything, right? They stay at home, they don't shop, they don't eat, they don't go and see family. Studies have also found that couples have seven major fights during the holiday season. 
If you're looking at it in terms of week, you started fighting with your spouse last week, right? Some of you are feeling that right now. And most of those fights aren't even about your marriage. They're just about holidays. It's about money. It's about time and the way that you're spending it. It's about the family expectations, about who's coming over to our house. It's about traditions, all of it. And so my hope with that being true is that this series has helped. And my hope for today as we kind of close this whole thing out is that it's the perfect amount of Cool Whip to your pumpkin pie. I'm in full food mode right now. I got one service left before Thanksgiving, and so I'm ready. Now, before I get into today's teaching, though, I do, I do want to say this, because I've had so many really good conversations in the lobby about what we've talked about the past few weeks, but the same thing keeps coming up, which is, hey, this is really hard, and I'm not really seeing what I was hoping to see as I head into Thanksgiving. And so um, let me just say this before we get into today's topic. The applications that we talked about in this series will take time. Establishing boundaries with your family takes time. Right? It takes setting those boundaries. It takes them pushing on those boundaries, setting them again, and watching it be successful in the future. Honoring your parents through personal growth so you can have the hard conversations you need to have with them takes time. It takes time for you to have them. It takes time for them to receive those conversations. A healthy, growing, life-giving, grace-filled marriage takes time. And so when you walk away from Thanksgiving next week, if things aren't what you had hoped for or what you prayed they would be, just don't give up. Keep doing the healthy things and it will eventually produce fruit. You might see it a little bit this year, but if you keep doing those things, you'll see even more of it next holiday season. And so over the past few weeks, we've been reading in the book of Ephesians and we've mostly read from Ephesians five and six, but for today, we're gonna jump back to the beginning. And I don't really like giving away what I'm talking about before we get there, before we read scripture, but I'm gonna do that today because as we wrestle with this family stuff, there's this core idea in the book of Ephesians that we're gonna talk about today. And it's that family is what we choose it to be. Family is what we choose it to be. And I know this sounds like a quote from Vin Diesel in The Fast and Furious, it's not. Like it could be, but it's not. It's actually one of the core ideas that Paul talks about to this church in Ephesus. And there's two big pieces of this. Here's the first, Paul says this, Ephesians 1, starting in verse five. He says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, when you put your faith in Jesus, it isn't just about the forgiveness of sins. It isn't just about an eternity in heaven where there is no more pain and there is no more sorrow, right? It isn't just about life to the fullest now and life to the fullest forever. It's that you also get brought into God's family. And don't miss this. Let's read verse five again. It says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. God decided in advance to do this. He chose you in advance. He sent his son to die on a cross because he wants you to be a part of his family. And so here's the first takeaway for today. God chooses us to be a part of his family. Now, some of you have had parents walk out on you. Some of you have never had parents tell you that they love you. Some of you never had parents show you that you were wanted, that you mattered, that you weren't a burden. Some of you were told that you were an accident, right? Usually with like, oh, happy accident with joking around it, but you were still told that you were not intentional. And because of that, you have wounds in your life that have left you wondering, does anyone love me? Does anyone care about me? Does anyone want me? And the answer is always yes because God does. God loves you. God cares about you. God wants to adopt you into his family. This is what he wanted to do, and it gives him great pleasure. And he knows how broken we are. He knows how sinful we are. He knows that deep, dark secret that we haven't told anyone. He knows what we've done. He knows that we are doing the wrong thing, and we know that we're doing the wrong thing, even though we know the right thing to do. But he still chose us because he loves us. But here's the thing when it comes to faith and our relationship with Jesus. While God chooses us to be a part of his family, we also have to choose to be a part of that family as well. Faith is always a two-way street. Skipping ahead a few verses, Paul writes this in Ephesians 2.8. 
He says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. When you believed. God chooses us to be a part of his family and nothing can take that choice away. But what he asks for in return is belief. Belief that Jesus is the son of God. Belief that he lived a perfect life and went to the cross in order to be the forever sacrifice for our sins. Belief that he resurrected from the dead, proving that his promises of grace and new life and family are real. So let me just say this. For some of you, this has been a really hard series. It's just been really tough to wrestle with this idea of family. And the reason why is because maybe you don't have a family. You don't have a family that you're close to. Or, or maybe you look at your family and it's not the family that you want to have. Or, or maybe your family is the main core source of pain in your life. And Paul tells us there's another option on the table. There's always another family that we can be a part of. But it starts with belief. It starts with you putting your faith in Jesus and trusting him to lead your life. In the Bible, the action that's connected to this belief is baptism. Baptism is a physical action that represents the faith and belief that you are choosing in Jesus. And so for some of you, as you sit through this series and you long for this idea of family and you long for this idea of unconditional love and you long for this idea of wanting to be chosen and you're searching it out in your family and not finding it, the place that this is found is God. And so really, ultimately, the, the most important thing about this series is if you want to have a healthier family, it just starts with Jesus. And it starts with you believing, trusting him. And when you put your faith in Jesus and get baptized, you never have to wonder again if somebody wants you in their life. You never have to wonder again if you are loved. You never have to wonder again if you are worthy because God says you are, always and forever, in spite of how you, what you do and don't do. Psalm 68, five and six says this, father to the fatherless, defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. And so it doesn't matter if you have a great family. It doesn't matter if you have a dysfunctional family, a terrible family, or if you don't have a family at all. God chooses you to be a part of his. And this doesn't mean that your biological family still doesn't exist. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't still have to work on boundaries and grace and growth when it comes to them. This just means the pain you feel from your family isn't the end all be all when it comes to family. It just means that family goes beyond blood, that God chooses us to be a part of his family. But if we want to be a part of that, it's also on us to believe because we get to choose what family looks like. Now, here's the second thing that Paul says about family. Just a few verses later, he says this in Ephesians 2, 17. He says, he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. And let me just explain this as, as quickly as I can. In the Bible, Jews were essentially people who believed in God and Gentiles were people who did not. And in the beginning of the New Testament, the prevailing thought was that Jesus came to rescue God's chosen people, the Jews, and no one else. But then God, in the book of Acts, speaks to a guy named Peter and tells him that Jesus died for Jews and Gentiles. That Jesus came, he died for every single person, not just one group of people. And that the goal wasn't just that Jewish people believed and put their faith in Jesus, but that all people would believe, that all people would hear this good news, that all people would hear about this grace and they would believe and put their faith in him. The parallel today essentially would be churches that think they only exist for Christian people and not for people who don't also go to church. Now that's not a far-fetched idea. Some of you grew up in that church where it was just about Christians, but that, that's not the way the church is supposed to be because in Acts 10, this barrier between these believing and non-believing groups of people were removed. And so summing it all up, it's this, Jesus came for people who are far from him and didn't believe in God and for people who believed in God already. But then Paul continues. He says, now all of us can come to the Father through the, same, through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. And this is the most important part. He says, you are members of God's family. And I love this because one of the things that Paul is telling the church in Ephesus is that they are a family. 
Right? They belong to this community together. He's saying it doesn't matter where you are from. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, what culture you grew up in. Right? When you put your faith in God, you become a part of this family together. He's reframing the idea of family. He's reframing the idea of household. He's reframing this concept that they have. And so here's the second takeaway today. We can choose who we call family. Family is not just relegated to the people we share genetics with. Family can be the people we worship with. It can be the people we are in community with. It can be the people we choose to be closest to. And so here's what I'm gonna do today. Um, if we have some say in who we call our family and if family goes beyond blood, how do we reconcile all of these things? Like how do we reconcile this with the family that we currently have? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach through something that I learned years ago that's helped me a lot when it comes to the relationships I have in my life. And I actually taught through this the first Sunday that COVID shut us down. And so I'm not sure anybody saw it. Um, and so I, I think this is vital for us when it comes to understanding the roles our family plays in our lives and the role that the family we choose plays in our lives. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this whiteboard, but it's also gonna be up on the screen as well. Um, so if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to do that. I guess you can take pictures if you want, um, but I always encourage, write it down. You, you remember things better that way. So if you're taking notes, do this first. Write down, uh, write a big circle. That's pretty good. All right, and write the word crowd. So everybody has a crowd that they're a part of. And this is the neighborhood that you live in. These are the fans of the same sports team that you root for. If you go to school, like this is your whole school, like all the grades included in that. Your crowd is made up of people that you don't really know personally, but they're there, right? They're kind of around. The one thing that you really have in common with your crowd is essentially proximity, like same place, same neighborhood, same school, you know, they're, they're kind of in that vicinity with you. And every single person has a crowd. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to draw another circle inside the last one and then write the word community. So your community is a little bit smaller than your crowd. Typically, it's like 150 to 200 people. Um, this would be church on Sunday. Right, that, we have about 200 people at each service here at Collective. And while you don't know everyone, we're all here for essentially the same reason. We're here to learn and grow in our faith. We're here to experience Jesus. We're here to be a part of this church called Collective. And there are times when we do things all together, right? Grocery store buyout, we celebrate our birthday. And so we'll come together as one big group to serve the community. We come together as one big group to celebrate what God's doing, to have some fun. And while you do that, you'll bump into some people that you might not know, but you recognize, hey, we're all a part of this thing together. We're a part of this shared experience. We have this shared connection that's called collective. If you're in school, this is your grade level. These are the kids you take your classes with. Maybe your locker is in the same hallway as them. Like you have different assemblies together with that class. At work, if you work for a bigger company, this is the team you work on. Right? You maybe know some of them personally, but some of those people maybe you just know by email only, right? And so you correspond that way. As a parent, this is kind of the group of parents that you're a part of. If your kids go to daycare, your kids are in school, your kids are on a team, you're not really close to those other parents, but you know, hey, we're a part of this community together because our kids go to the same school or, or interact in that way. Now I want you to draw another circle inside the last one and write the word core. Your core group of people is a smaller group. Typically, it's just 10 to 20 people that you interact with on a regular basis. These are people who are part of your life regularly. If you serve on a team at Collective, if you go to a small group, those people would be a part of your core. If you play on a sports team, that, that would be a part of your core. It's the, the three or four neighbors that you spend holidays with, you know, watching football or, or Fourth of July, stuff like that. These are people that you're closer to. You know their names. You occasionally share meals together. You have similar hobbies or you're in similar stages of life. You know parts of each other's stories. You have deeper conversations and there's a healthy level of trust. Right? These are people that you pray for. These are people that you care for. You would ultimately say that these, these people matter to you. These people are your friends. Now inside of that small circle, I want you to write the word crew. This is the smallest group of people in your life. Your crew are the people who you live with day in and day out, right? These are your inner circle. 
These are the people who you call when your life is falling apart or who call you when their life is falling apart. These are people that you are real and vulnerable with. These are people who don't have to knock before they come into your house. And that's not because they have no boundaries and don't understand personal space. It's because you don't have anything to hide from them. They know your insecurities. They know your fears. They encourage you. They pick you up when you fall. They breathe life into your faith and your children and your marriage, all of it. Another way to put this is that these are the type of people that have a seat at your table. A few years ago, we did a sermon series called Bad Blood. It was all about relationships. And last week of the series, we actually talked about how do we end the toxic relationships that we have in our lives. And we compared our crew to a dinner table. There are just a few empty seats, but we get to decide who sits at that table. We get to decide the voices that we listen to. We get to decide the people we trust. Because the people who get seats at that table have an impact on who we are and how we live our life, right? These are the people who impact how we live. These are the impact, people who impact our day-to-day. -day. These are the people who impact how we see ourselves. They impact our joy. And really, as we talk about this idea of family, this is the family that we choose. And we see this in Jesus's life. Jesus always had a crowd around him. Everywhere he went, you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a group of people followed him. And so there's this crowd of people that would follow. These are essentially spectators in his life. Like maybe some of them were genuinely interested in what he was doing. Honestly, some of these people were just haters, but they were on the outside looking in. Jesus also had a community. You read the stories in the gospels. And again, about 150 to 200 people that followed Jesus from town to town. He would have called these his disciples. Now, what you'll also read is that this 150 to 200 number kind of shifts because sometimes people would leave. Right? When they wanted something from Jesus, he didn't give them. They would go, I'm out. They would head out. Then he would do a miracle and, and, and other people would jump in and say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lean in to this a little bit. And so he, he was Jesus, so he knew everybody's name because he knows everything. Um, but he wasn't super tight with everybody in his community. And then Jesus had a core. These are his 12. These are what we call the apostles. These are people that he had meals with, that he hung out together. They spent every moment they could together. They had a close and personal relationship. He knew their life stories. He knew what was going on with them. But then we also read that Jesus had a crew. He had these three guys named Peter, James, and John that he was closest to. And there are times when he steps out of all three of these things and he takes his three away just to have moments together. Right? They shared moments together praying to God. They shared moments together as he shared what was going to happen to him. These were his three closest people. And really, this was the family that he chose. When Jesus is up on a cross, he looks down at his mom, Mary, and he looks at one of his boys, John. He says, John, this is your mom. And mom, this is your son now. Right? And Jesus had siblings, and Mary had other children. But Jesus is saying, hey, like, I'm handing this responsibility off to my guy because he, he's going to take care of you. When thinking about Paul being in this book of Ephesians, Paul had the same thing. He had this crowd that existed around him that watched what he was doing. He had the communities. These are all the churches that he had helped start. Like the church in Ephesus was a community that he was a part of. He had a core group of people, right? There were elders in each one of the churches that he trusted, uh, people that he spent time with, people that he sent these letters to and then would bring to the rest of the congregations. But Paul also had a crew. These are people that he name drops at the end of every single one of his letters, guys like Timothy and Aristarchus and Luke, people that supported him while he was in prison, that took care of him. These are people that he trusted, that he taught a lot of things to to carry on his mission. And so the thing is, we all have these circles of people in our lives. Right? Everybody has these different types of things, these different circles of people. And typically, when we think of stuff like this, what we do is we think about just relationships. Think about our neighbors, we think about our friends, but as we talk about family in this series, I wanna talk about how this relates to our families. And so let me ask you this, when thinking about this idea, where do you place your family in these circles? Right? Not, not where should you, right now in your life, where are you placing your family? Are they in the crowd? Are they essentially pushed so far out of your life that they don't uh, really have a relationship with you? You're not close. Um, they're definitely not a priority. Are they in your community? Right? A little bit tighter in, there's somewhat of a relationship there, uh, but they don't have a say in who you are, how you live your life. They don't really dictate things. They're not a priority when it comes to that. Are they in your core? 
right? You spend intentional time with them. You have a good relationship with them. You love and care for each other, but there's still the boundary that there are people that you're even closer with. Or are they in your crew? Right? Are they people that hold you accountable? Are they people that call you out on your crap, but also then you get to call them out on their crap? Right? Because one of the things about crew is that this is also a two-way street. Right? This is giving and taking. This is deposits and withdrawals. Right? Sometimes in the core, it's not that way. Maybe you care for them a little bit more than they care for you, and that's okay. But in this space, it's equal care, equal support, e equal life. And so are they there? Are they in this space? Are they people that you can be vulnerable with? Vulnerable with? Are they people who push you to be the best version of yourself? But you can also push them to be the best version of their self. Are they people that allow you to set boundaries and then respect those boundaries when you enforce them? Because here's my theory. My theory is that most people have a dysfunctional family because they have passively placed their family in their crew because that's what they feel like they're obligated to do. Right? We, we accidentally or maybe like passively or just forgetfully allow people in our life to be in this circle even though they do not belong in this circle. And that creates tension for us, right? It's the idea that because they're family, you feel obligated to allow your parents to speak into how you're raising your kids because they're your parents. Or because it's family, you feel obligated to let your siblings interrupt your life. Or because it's family, you feel obligated to spend the holidays with the extended second, third, fourth, fifth cousins just because they're family. And the thing is, this creates tension and what it is, is you have the right people in the wrong circles, and you have the wrong people in the right circles. And so hear me, and this is kind of a big thing for today. Just because they're related to you by blood doesn't mean they belong in these closest circles. It doesn't. Right? Just because they're your family doesn't mean they belong right here. And that is part of the reason why you feel so much tension during the holidays, because you put them in that place, and it is one-sided, or it's unhealthy, or really it's just toxic in the end. Just because they are your parents doesn't mean they get to speak into your life. They, they don't have that right, right? Yeah, they raised you and said, I put you in this world, I can take you back out of it. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't, right? Just because they're your parents doesn't mean they get to be right here. Yes, they sacrificed a lot for you. Yes, they love you a lot, but that does not mean this is their place. Just because you grew up with them doesn't mean they get to be a part of everything. Right? It doesn't mean you push other people out so they can be a part of everything. Just because you share some genetics with them doesn't mean they get to be a priority in your life. It doesn't. Now, you can choose those things. You can choose to let your parents speak into your life. You can choose to let your siblings be in part of the most important moments of your life. You can choose to let your aunts and uncles and cousins get priority in your life. But it is a choice, not an obligation, because you get to decide what influence the people in your life have. You get to decide what the right circle is for your family. Right? And the thing is, maybe you're super close to a sibling and they are in your crew, right? And that's okay. That's a good thing. Like you, you can totally do that, but it's not a package deal. Just because one sibling's here doesn't mean they all get to be here, right? Just because one cousin's here doesn't mean the whole entire network of aunts and uncles gets to be here because you have a choice, right? This isn't a package deal, but we feel like it is. Right? We feel like, because it's family, they've got to be in the center, and that just isn't true. And so the point is this. We have people in our lives, neighbors, coworkers, friends, and family, but not every single person belongs in the same circle. And one of the reasons we have so much baggage when it comes to our families is because we put people in the wrong places. And so let me ask you a few questions in light of this. Which circle is the healthiest place for your parents to be? Right, you get to decide. And, and really, I, I don't have a right answer for you. Right? I, have, I have a right answer for me, but you, you get to decide this for yourself. There isn't really a right or wrong here. It's still your choice. Which circle is the healthiest place for your siblings to be? Again, you get to decide. They're not a package deal. You might like one and hate the other, okay? Like, that's part of life. Some siblings are the worst, okay? <laughs> what is the healthiest place for your aunts and uncles to be? Some of you are closer to them than you are your own parents. And the thing is, because you're close to your aunts and uncles, you put your parents here, even though your aunts and uncles should be here. And really, you need to start pushing your parents out. And that's okay. You're allowed to do that. Those are decisions that you get to make. 
Because here's the thing, when you have the right understanding of where the people are in your life, there's a lot less tension. There's a lot less dysfunction. There's a lot less drama. When you put people into the right places, when you understand where they fit, you will feel less disappointment and less anger and less just overall not wanting to be around them. And, and, and here's the thing. Some of you have people in your life, a family specifically, that should be in your crowd. This is not mean, okay? Like I, I know some of your stories. I know what your family has done to you. You can push them this far out. That is okay. Right? You are allowed to do that. You are allowed to create that boundary and you are allowed to put people in the right places. But the thing is you have to decide where they go. You have to decide who gets to speak into your life. You have to decide what relationship you have with them. And the thing is, as you, as you wrestle with this and as you go through this, this week, it doesn't mean your family is going to understand. Your family is going to still try to force their way into whatever circle they want to be in. In fact, that's probably the tension you feel as your family forces their way into this spot and you're going to have to push them back out. But the thing is, you can't control them. And remember, one of the themes of this series is that we can change our family, but we can change how we deal with them. And one of the ways that we do that is to put them into the right places in our life. And the other side of this is that this also means we need to put the right people into the middle of our lives, right? And this is what becomes family because your crew is, is essentially the family that you choose. These are the brothers and sisters that you choose. These are the aunts and uncles for your kids that you choose. Every fall, we have a tradition of going to Brookfield Farm to pick pumpkins with some of our friends. And even though we aren't blood related, all these kids have grown up together and so they call each other cousins. And this year we climbed into the tractor and they, they bring us to the patch where we pick them out. And one of the little girls said, hey, these are all my cousins. And the guy driving the tractor said, I can see that, what a great family. And it's like, they don't look alike at all, but that's fine. <laughs> but then one of the little girls spoke up and said, we aren't a real family, we're a fake family. <laughs> she goes, those are my fake aunts and my fake uncles and my fake cousins. And the, the guy just like politely walked away. He's like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, but here's the thing. Yeah, it's, it is our fake family, but it's the family that we've chosen. And we, we all have blood-related people that we love. We all have blood-related people that we don't love as much. But we choose to spend more time with our fake family and that's just because the relationships are different. It's because the relationships are more real. They're deeper. Honestly, there's less baggage. There isn't that weird family hierarchy where you always feel like the older relatives are in charge, even though everyone there is an adult. We didn't have to feel the tension of trying to figure out how these old traditions that our parents raised us up and fit into how our new lives are going, because we could just make new traditions on our own. We have very intentionally picked our people, and it's one of the best things that Ray and I have done. In fact, it's taken pressure off my real family relationships because those relationships are now healthier as a result. Because we have this crew of people in our life, my expectations have changed for my family. The pressure I feel has changed. The frustration I feel has changed. And so as we wrap up, things today. Let me leave you this, with this, because I believe this is what uh, can really change some of the holidays for you as you move forward. Who is the family that you choose? Right? Who are the people in your crew that you should be creating traditions with? And what can you do to get the right people in the right places and the wrong people into the right places as well? Because I promise you that if you take the time to do this, as, long as, as, as well as the other applications in this series, your holidays will be more drama-free every year, right? Cho choose your family. Choose the people who have a say in your life. Choose the people who you depend on. Choose the people that you get to do life with. Put the right people in the right places, not just friends, not just coworkers, but your family as well, and you will experience peace you will feel less tension in the holidays and next year will be even better than this year. Let's pray. God, when we think about this idea of family, um, like we talked about for four weeks, man, it is so complicated. It is dysfunctional. Um, it is uh, not easy to manage. Um, but God, one thing that we're thankful for 
is that the Bible is just full of wisdom and truth and um, godly ways to handle uh, our interpersonal relationships with the people that, that we're related to. Um, God, uh, as we read earlier in Ephesians, it, it gives us wisdom and understanding. And so, God, I just pray as we, we close out this series, as we get ready to head into Thanksgiving, that this year isn't the year where we just hope and pray things are different. Um, but God, we actually put the right things in place so they might be different. Um, God, we don't hope and pray that, uh, that there's healthier family members coming to, to eat Thanksgiving with us, but God, that we become the healthier family members. Um, and we see how that plays out. And God, I just pray for everybody here uh, who just struggles with this idea of family, whether they have a good family or a great family or, or no family at all, God, that they understand that the baseline of this entire thing um, is that we also get to be part of your family. Uh, and that should give us hope. That should give us peace. Uh, that should bring less frustration into our earthly family. Um, and God, I, I just pray that as we, we, we keep moving forward with this, um, God, we also start deciding, like, what are the family that we want to be around? God, who are the people in the middle of our life that we speak into their life and they speak into ours? Um, and God, we really put that first because we'll see that bless every other circle that we have. God, thank you um, that no matter what we have going on in our life, we get to be a part of your family. God, thank you um, that you chose us to be a part of that, knowing full well that we are just messy, broken, dysfunctional people. God, we thank you and love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.